Our third speaker is uh, Valerie Hope from the Open uh, University. Uh, Valerie is the sort of go-to person when uh, we're dealing with uh, Roman funerary, funerary monuments and memorialisation. So, uh, over to you, Valerie. about material culture, about objects and things, 
It deals more with textual sources and directly with the objects themselves. Now, it may well be possible to do this the other way around and start with the objects, but the current task is more about finding the stories around objects than the objects telling their own stories. What I'm interested in is what the living did with and what they thought of the stuff the dead left behind. That said, the approach and conclusions are heavily influenced by recent work on material culture, the agency of objects, artifact biographies, object actor networks, and sensory approaches. So let's first of all think about the range of possible actions or reactions and responses that are to what the dead leave behind. I'm talking initially and um, quite cross-culturally here. So we cannot choose how someone dies, but we can choose if and how to separate from their possessions. And a range of options are available which can broadly be categorised as investment and divestment. Now such a polarity is clearly a simplification. And it's also worth remembering that although there are active decisions to be made, Sometimes those aren't completely within the control of the bereaved or the survivors. Um, cultural, societal and religious expectations can govern what should be kept or disposed of, or in other contexts, sorting and categorising, deciding what to keep, etc., can be dictated by time constraints or familial demands. Plus, different types of objects may be treated in different ways, and across time, um, initial reactions may change to those objects. Plus, and this is quite an important one to remember, the dead themselves may continue to exert some control through the last will and testament about the fate of their belongings. In divestment, there are choices uh, such as destruction, sale, redistribution and repurposing. And there are varied motives as to why possessions may be disposed of or got rid of in some way. And these can range from fear of death pollution to financial necessity to the need to distance oneself from the dead in some way. And of course these motives may all overlap. Investment involves keeping items for uh, continuing use, perhaps for future use, or treating items with a certain reverence, uh, maybe ritualising them or regarding them as in some way precious. And again, there are varied reasons for retaining items, for example, they may just have a very useful practical use, or financial value, or sentimental value. And one aspect, though again, it can readily overlap with other reasons, is memory. <coughs> items may be kept because they act almost as souvenirs of the dead, evoking particular experiences, events, images, routines, or habits, and or have the potential to become commemorative items or in longer term, are uh, end. So for the Roman world, can we identify what types of personal items were kept and the extent to which and how these were perceived as objects of memory? Now at this point, it needs to be noted briefly that divesting or disposing of the possessions of the dead was also an option. The placing of personal items in graves or on the pyre is widely attested. That said, and allowing for regional variations across the empire, most graves were unfurnished in the Roman period. So it was not assumed or always ritually essential that the personal possessions of the dead had to go with them to the grave. Nor in general were possessions viewed as polluted or unalienable. So they could be sold or given away. So in the Roman world then, there could be varied options as to the fate of the dead's belongings. In terms of what was kept, wills and legal texts that reference wills are to some extent useful here. Now we probably shouldn't overstate the case. Even if Pliny did claim that a will was a mirror of a man's character, most wills were very short and to the point. Most surviving wills, um, generally written on papyrus and surviving from Egypt, are often of late date. Most do not itemise household goods or personal possessions. Instead, the wills were chiefly concerned with identifying an heir or heirs. And the usual provision was for said heir to inherit all the property of the deceased, with specific references usually limited to the big ticket items like land and money. Wills could, however, also list separate legacies. Again, these mainly cover money and land, but occasionally make reference to other items. The example on the slide, uh, it's late in date. The reason I've included it is because it's a relatively complete example 
and it gives you an idea of the types of things that could be specified. So clothing, plates, spoons, silverware. Another example is the will of Justinius from Rome. Um, again, this is quite fragmentary in terms of the inscription, but we can see in various points specific items are being identified and left to named individuals. So here they're quite fancy things in gold and silver. The digest um, of Roman law is perhaps the most useful here, with its sections on legacies. And in amongst these are personal portable items. So we can note references to silverware, gems, clothes, toilet items, jewellery, tableware, necklaces, rings. So these, again, are items being singled out and left to specified individuals. Now, ultimately, these snippets, as it were, can only tell us so much about the givers, the items, and the recipients. As already noted, wills simply don't list most of the dead's possessions. The primary focus in wills is, is often on seemingly expensive items, which are valued for their monetary worth. And in the digest, these examples are often being, often being used to highlight an inheritance problem. So here, for example, in the middle, we've got somebody leaving three dishes. What happens if you can't work out what is meant by my smaller dish? Um, or, or the second one down, there's a large pearl left to somebody. Testator dies, obviously, they get the will open, they can't find the large pearl. What are you supposed to do? So they're, they're, you know, as a document, it's fulfilling a specific function. So it has its limitations as to how we interpret it. But there are a few things that we can tentatively call out concerning these legacies. Considered decisions are being made about to whom certain possessions should be given. The testator was bestowing a financial benefit to be sure, but also potentially a more emotive, personal and sentimental one. There is a sense that some of these items are being left to people, relatives and friends, who would make practical use of them, but also potentially treasure them. The gifts bind people together. Now, two of the recipients mentioned here are described in affectionate terms. So we've got uh, my dearest daughter and then my dearest uh, slayer. It could be dearest, could be translated as sweetest. And thus the bequeathed items are bound up in networks of affection and become tokens of the relationship. These gifts also strongly evoke the senses, especially touch and sight, but also possibly smell and taste as well. These are items associated with the body, things that were worn and handled, that adorned and perfumed, and as such had the power to evoke the former physicality of the testator. It's also apparent that we are largely in the realm of female gift giving here. Now this may in part be a result of the idiosyncrasies of the digest, not to mention the nature of Roman property and inheritance laws. Yet gender can be embodied and manifested in material things, and these women may have been symbolising emotional attachments to other women by identifying and bequeathing personal, intimate items, thereby giving these items specific meaning. So we gain a sense of the possessions that could be singled out, and that these have the potential to evoke the identity and memory of the deceased. The wills, however, tell us little about how the bereaved or the survivors may have interacted with these objects. What did they do with them? Did they keep them, treasure them, did they flog them or shove them to the back of a cupboard? A handful of other sources can perhaps help a little bit. One is the epitaph of Alia Potesta from Rome. It's a bit of an unusual example, to be sure. It's very long, very poetic, has some slightly weird and interesting content. But I'm just interested in a little bit at the end of the epitaph, where her commemorator, the man who commissioned the inscription, who uh, possibly is her patron, possibly her lover or partner, mentions that he has a piece of golden jewellery inscribed with her name, or at least that's what it would appear to be. And I've given a couple of possible translations of the the uh, Latin involved. Now we don't know exactly what this is. Um, it could be a ring, more probably it's a bracelet, and I'm probably going to call it a bracelet. Um, we also don't know the origins of this item. Did it once belong to Alia Potesta and her commemorator had inherited it? Had it been a gift from her to him while she was still alive? 
or had he had it made after her death. Now this may well be a commissioned commemorative item. Nonetheless, how it is characterised is at least suggestive of the power of individualised, personalised possessions. The bracelet has become a form of miniaturised mourning or memory, something intimate and discreet, even though the gold is a bit showy and flashy to be sure. And it alters and affects the body of the wearer. It is part of his daily routine, it would seem, and the choice to wear it is an active and considered act of commemoration. The commemorator here puns with the name Potestas. It is almost a protective or inspiring aspect to it. The bracelet is like an amulet that, that comforts as well as commemorates. It is as if it can magically evoke Alia, and in some ways gives her a continuing presence. Now we can't tell whether the name was inscribed on the inside or the outside of the bracelet. Was the name visible to others, or did it touch the skin of the wearer? Now naming the dead was an important part of funeral ritual and commemoration. Even if you weren't called Potestas, there was power in the name. And we do find um, names and relationships cropping up on items of jewellery, although it has to be said not very frequently. Um, understanding what these names and relationships are, or what function they're performing, is complex. In some cases, these may be uh, makers' marks or names, owners' names, love tokens such as betrothal rings, initials on seals. Um, but maybe we have to also consider the possibility that, like the Alia de Testas bracelet, some of these may have been forming commemorative roles. But what I would raise is that whatever the purpose of the original decision to include or add the name or relationship, this information stayed with the item. And if others inherited said item, it may have taken on a memorial function. And if worn, the identity of the new owner became entwined with the identity of the original owner. So through use and wear, the bracelet, I'm calling it a bracelet, that named the Tessa had agency. It was part of the commemorator's routine to wear it to keep the memory and the presence of Alia close to him. And we can imagine the same for other items, whether named or not, such as clothes, perfume jars or mirrors. Routines, habits, and daily rituals could become centred on relatively mundane but memory-laden items. An anecdote from Suetonius is suggestive of the personal resonance of certain inherited objects. Now, Vespasian's family didn't have much by way of ancestral portraits, but the family home remained important to him. And this preserved an aspect of the place that evoked his childhood and the relationships that defined it. The most powerful man in the world with access to money, gold, silver and jewels treasured in particular a small silver cup. Why? Because it belonged to his gran. The value in the item was in the association that it held, not in the silver. And further Vespasian made the cup part of regular rituals. Using the cup, seeing it, holding it, touching it, Bringing it to his lips, tasting the wine, brought him close to a dead loved one. This was active, not passive, memory work. Another example is through somewhat negative characterisation of how the former possessions could evoke the dead is found in Seneca. Seneca, in slightly lecturing mode, as always, <laughs> emphasises the memory of Marcia that she will not find her dead son at his tomb, no more than she'll find him in his old clothes. Seneca is stressing the finality of death and the end of a physical presence. Yet he is also, even if somewhat indirectly, suggesting that some people did seek comfort at the tomb in the idea that the dead might have some sort of continuing physical presence and that clothes and other items left behind <coughs> might also evoke that physical presence, even if Seneca doesn't approve. Now this reminds me of a quite well-known quote from Stalabras who talks about the role of clothing in mourning. Um, the magic of cloth I came to believe is that it receives us, receives our smell, our sweat, our shape even, 
And when our parents, our friends, our lovers die, the clothes in their closets still hang there, holding their gestures, both reassuring and terrifying, touching the living with the dead. So this evokes the ability of clothing in particular to hold memories. In fact, more than memories. It's almost like the very essence of the dead, um, with both negative and positive consequences for the inheritors. Now, another Roman example of the evocative nature of clothing, I have to make it a slightly extreme one, it's not from the domestic um, context, and it's exploited for political ends, is Caesar's bloodstained toga. Now, to be sure, this becomes part of the theatrics of his funeral. But for a short time, the clothes of the dead tokened the living body, evoked the wearer, and his bloody fate. So clothes and other possessions of the dead could then evoke very specific memories and events, or be more generic reminders of a present absence. The items that we've noted here, so clothes, the gold bracelet of Alia Potesta, the silver cup of Vespasian's gram, these were potentially expensive, valuable items, the types of things, as we've seen, that could be singled out in wills. But the potency of these objects for memory lay not in their intrinsic monetary value, but in their associations with the dead. Associations which may have been shared with inexpensive items too, whether it's a pottery vessel, a lamp, a stylus, even a cooking pot. So to pull uh, a few threads together. Galinsky has stated that ancient Rome was a memory culture par excellence. The past was everywhere defining spaces, places, and people. Active memory strategies filled the public imagination, and these operated for the more modest and humble in society, as well as the great and famous, since the cemetery, epitaphs, monuments, and rituals of commemoration provided public expression and shape for remembering the, the dead. But remembering the dead also happened in the home. Now, there's nothing new in saying this. Statues, portraits, the imaginaries, the family shrine have long been recognised as important media for promoting the family past and remembering the ancestors. But what I've wanted to highlight here is that the dead could be present, and perhaps more potently so, at least for the recently bereaved, through the more mon mundane and often bodily focused things they left behind. Their clothes, their jewellery, their mirror, their favourite cup. Now, these things may be less accessible to us, more difficult to grasp, and the evidence I've presented here is perhaps more tantalising than concrete. But what is clear is that people did inherit stuff from other people, and some of this stuff was highly personal and inherently charged with memories. Now, remembering through objects could be a very selective and personalised form of remembering. Aspasian chose a cup. But it could have been, and others may well have fixated on a different item, or indeed no personal items at all. I don't want to suggest that everyone was walking the streets of Rome wearing their dead dad's old toga because of <laughs> As noted earlier, keeping, using, and remembering through possessions or select possessions is only one possible response as to what to do with the things that the dead leave behind. People may also have divergent responses to the same or similar items. Ultimately, we can note how people could be connected by objects, the networks of relationships that the objects tokened, and the role that memory may have played in this, but we often cannot recreate what that remembering precisely involved or what triggered it for the individual. Despite the very personal and, to some extent, ad hoc aspects to this form of remembering, it should not be overlooked. It could be a very potent form for materialising the absent, for creating a continuing presence for the dead in the ongoing lives of the living. These material objects were not just passive and inanimate things, since the interactions between people and objects incorporated activity, rituals and habits. These were not static display items representing a groomed or edited version of the dead for general public consumption, the items to be used. The owner might be gone, but these things kept going. 
and there was a dynamic relationship between people and objects dependent on the materiality of the objects, their usefulness, their shape, their colour, their weight, their texture. And in particular, the objects noted here were often body-focused. Items that created connections and a sense of identification between the body of the mourner and the body of the deceased. The senses could play a key part in this. The touch of clothes, the scent of perfume from the ointment jar, a name placed next to the skin. These physical responses and interactions gave a physicality to the absent lost loved one. The dead were made material again through objects and the materiality of the objects, their sensory dimensions, were significant triggers for memories. So did people view these everyday items as memorials? That is, objects designed or intended to promote memory. Perhaps not. Some items may have been specifically commissioned. The idea of Tesla's bracelet, for example, may well have been what we might term a piece of mourning jewellery. And it's worth noting that the composer of her epitaph also mentions a portrait that he's got and it seems to be for domestic rather than tomb use, and he suggests that garlands and flowers were regularly offered to it. So that is to say, within the home, and about the person, there could be items which had an overt memorialising function. The more mundane inherited items, however, were not made as memorials, but part of their individual object biography may have entailed, at certain points at least, a memorial function. This memorial function was often predicated on the continuing use of the item. That is, the item didn't change into a memorial. It continued as necklace or cape or mirror that had added memorial agency. The item could also continue to evolve and change and outlive this memorial role. Or the latter might come to define it with the object gaining heirloom status. The object might move from being a signifier of personal or individual memory to a more generalised symbol of shared collective memory, even if still confined to the family or smaller social group. The potency of many of these material objects as memory objects may also have been relatively short-lived. A portrait might be identified for generations, especially if named, but the significance of a small silver cup might be lost with time, even if it did become the heirloom. Vespasian treasured that silver cup in a way no one else could. Indeed, some of these objects may have performed a transitional role, helping the bereaved adapt to change and gradually accept the absence of the loved one. They may have been less about memory, or at least long-term memory, and more entwined with the process of letting go, or negotiating a new place for the dead in the lives living. After all, like memories, smells may fade, clothes may wear out, and the ongoing processes of use can change material objects physically and also dull or alter their emotive qualities. The object may outlive grief and indeed memory. To end, I want to leave you with the rest of Lerner's poem Residues, what his father in turn left behind and what Lerner anticipated leaving behind. In his words, too much, too much. Clearly, the 1980s learner predated the popularity of the gentle art of Swedish death cleaning. <laughs> and also, my own object with which I choose to remember my grandmother. Fortunately, she didn't own any silver cups or any silver, come to that. But when asked which of her possessions I would like to have, this was what I selected. Now, it's not exactly an everyday item I have to own. But it reminds me of my grand and of shared rituals. When I first had her, she also kind of smells a bit faintly of lavender and dust from like my granny's house. Now this item is now part of my children's annual rituals too, though they cannot remember their great grand. The item is a memory object to me. It may become a memory object to my children, but we won't be remembering quite the same.
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really addressed to John in the first instance anyway. It's about the cenotaph. I, I'm sure this is terribly well known, but it isn't known to me. Um, the whole business of um, creating uh, this monument, um, there are all sorts of ideas were put forward, um, but it does seem to me that so many of them are so close to what was happening in Athens and the, the sort of, um, you know, choosing a day on which every mm -hmm. year you commemorate and speeches and so on. Um, how much was the uh, discussions about the Senator based on classical precedents? I mean, the people who mm -hmm. produced it presumably had all been educated mm -hmm. in Greek mm -hmm. and Latin at the right sort of schools. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, <laughs> is, is there any... Well, the any wrong real sort of schools. <laughs> oh, exactly, <laughs> yes. Any, any evidence that, um, that, that they are actually directly going back to classical precedents? Well, I'll be, I'll be honest and say that I haven't had time to... I mean, it, 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 that question occurred to me as I was sort of hurriedly researching the Cenotaph stuff, and there is, there's acres of primary documents about the, the planning of the cere ceremony. Um, I haven't come across anything direct um, because I haven't gone into that much detail. Um, but I think the... Um, Lutyens was clearly kind of heavily influenced by classical architecture and classical forms, although he clearly resisted attempts to actually um, go in certain directions with that. So he, I mean, Lloyd George wanted a catafalque, you know, which is like a, a bed for a, uh, a, he wanted a sculpture of a catafalque, and Lutyens said, no, we're not doing that, we're doing a cenotaph. Um, and that's what he did. And I also, it's not clear necessarily that they actually planned to have a ceremony, the sorts of ceremony that's evolved, because initially that, um, the cenotaph was a temporary structure made out of wood and plaster, and it was put up in less than two weeks, and actually the government wanted to get rid of it again because it was disrupting traffic in Whitehall. But it became such a massive focus of collective mourning I mean, you see, you can see the, on YouTube, you can see Pathé footage, crowds and crowds of people, and they're passing wreaths over their heads, you know, like people crowd surf at pop concerts. Well, that, they're passing wreaths over to get to the front. So I think it took the, the, the officialdom completely by surprise how, how, how massive the reaction was to all this. So whether or, I mean, in a, for me, whether or not there was a classical, how far there was a classical influence or not, the thing took a life of its own. And it was originally meant for a victory parade, not a, not a memorial, right? So in a sense, for me, what's more interesting is, the, the, is, is, is how actually the people shaped what happened to that ceremony and that monument, rather than any kind of classicizing agenda that anyone may or may not have had. So, okay. Uh, I think there's another question over here. Yes, yeah. I was going to ask about the. I was going to ask about the Lucanian tombs. Perhaps it, it was made clear, but these were painted inside the tombs. Well, who, were, was who was expected to look at them? I mean, with 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 um, Egyptian tombs, you assume it was the dead wanting to see what was going to happen to them. But that doesn't make sense here. Who was supposed to look at them? Left open. Uh, yeah. 
were probably left open during the funerary ceremony. So you have to, so a system is essentially a box that you've got in the ground. So you've got the four slabs and then you would have had a lid. Um, so either a gabled roof or just a flat lid. And um, during the funerary ceremony, probably they were left open. Um, but what is interesting is that, uh, you know, it's, it, it would have been so much easier to paint those slabs in a workshop individually. Um, because the, the point, the fact that they were not, they were placed into the ground and they were painted, and we know that because the coat of plaster goes around. Now, that tells you, because it's not, it's not practical at all. So that tells you uh, that it was intentional. So it, the idea that, that the paintings are part, you, sometimes I think we over, <coughs> We underestimate the importance of the ceremony itself. We've got, you know, we are very practical and we think, well, you know, they have to be visible you know, for a long time, right? Whereas the funerary ceremony is a crucial moment. First of all, it may have lasted actually days, you know, we don't know in the case of the Lucanian tombs, but it is, regardless of how long it lasted, it really was crucial because it's that time the ritual had to be, has to be performed in a very specific way. You know, everything has to go well if you want the deceased to get to the underworld safe and sound. Um, so even if it's just that, so the moment in which the tomb is open, it's visible, A, to the family, um, B, probably to a broader community because we have to, you know, we think about death as a very private matter. But in antiquity, that was not a particularly private matter. Um, and also, those tombs are often placed, those necropolis are often placed on, um, on major roads um, leading into the city. Now, that for the cis tombs, the chamber tombs that I showed um, were probably, I mean, I find it hard to believe that such, you know, it, they're still sort of a couple of meters by, you know, two, three meters. So, in that case, uh, we can't really say that they were painted during the funerary ceremony. For the cis tombs, we know. For the chamber tombs, not necessarily. And the chamber tombs would have been, that's a different kind of ideology, because first of all, it's not an individual burial and it's sort of shared with the community, but it's the clan idea. So that's already sort of changing the relationship. Um, but, but the sort of short answer is that, you know, yes, they were for the deceased, but I strongly believe that they were for the living as well. And the idea that something is visible only during the funerary ceremony or only when the tomb is reopened to host a new deposition, for us, it's sort of, it's not worth it. But, but I think, you know, plenty of other, uh, I'm thinking about the painted tombs in Macedonia, for example. Palmyra? Palm, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, the idea that something is visible only um, during the ceremony. Also, I'm thinking about, not about the Peston ones, but um, about a chamber tomb in Apulia, so southeast Italy. What is interesting is that it would have been a chamber tomb and it was decorated on the pediment on the facade. And then the tomb was sort of backfilled. And you would think, well, it's no longer visible. But actually, um, conservators discover that the pediment itself was probably left above ground. Um, so that's very interesting, because the pediment was the part that was decorated. So the tomb would have been backfilled, um, but, but you would have had the sort of painted bit sticking out as a sort of grave marker. Uh, we can't prove it for all the tombs, but um, I was thinking about that one in Apulia. So there are different ways in which these paintings could have acted as grave markers or as, again, part of the death ritual itself. Um, and certainly there is the element of, of the sort of, you know, the paintings for the deceased. Um, but, but I think there's a lot more. There's a lot more involvement you know, in the part of the community. But thank you. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other, other questions? Uh, yes. I'll make it quick. <laughs> there should be someone behind you as well. Sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's for Dr. Hesk. Um, you said your, your granddad was commemorated on two monuments. Um, the Athenian naval war dead were barely commemorated at all, um, given, given the evidence we, we have. Do you have any view on why that would have been uh, in Athenian culture? Well, gosh. Um, the, well, there is this sort of idea that the, the sorry, there is this sort of <laughs> idea that the sort of Athen Athenian civic ideology is sort of, I don't know what the word, hoplite biased, as it were. 
um, hot plight and cavalry biased. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's hard to generalize. I mean, I think the, the sailors were commemorated on the casualty list, weren't they? I think. So they are at least, they get on a casualty list, but you're, you're, you're picking up on something there that I think is, is right, that there's this sense of, there's this sense of lack, relative lack of visibility somehow. And I think, and of course they are, that, that's the Thetes, they're the poorest class of Athenians. And they, you know, they don't have, they don't get, you know, the beginning of democracy, they don't, that class doesn't actually have proper political rights yet. So they're the engines, as always, they're the, en the engines of empire, least recognised, least visible. So. Thank you. And uh, I think it's Helen. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is for Valerie. Um, can I? Uh, I was going to ask. Um, do you feel that the Roman Romans would pro would be have been more present through objects than? than people are nowadays, just because there would be fewer objects around. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I suppose the simple answer is we can't be certain on, on that, but yeah, I suspect you're probably correct in some ways that certainly what you left behind was less for some people very less or, or only small amounts and therefore those things could certainly be imbued with a, a higher level of significance and quite often you do get the sense I didn't really discuss the difference between memory objects and heirlooms but certainly things that belong to the ancestors would gain a, a high level of precious status if you like for that very reason um, so it's one of those questions that I can't absolutely give an answer to but I suspect that it probably is some truth in it yes Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one, one, one more, one yeah. more. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I couldn't help thinking of relics while you were talking there. Be, be, people with presumably with very few possessions in some cases, in the the ascetics, uh, but um, objects became associated with them and became relics. Yet yeah, we've got anything to say on that. Um. But well, again, yes, the same, that things gain this kind of status, whether it's as heirlooms or relics, because they've got associations with the past, whether that's your ancestors or, or more broadly. The trouble is when we find things in the archaeological record, it's ascribing meaning to them as to what function they may have performed within the family or the wider um, social group. So we can theorise that people invested meaning into objects, that they kept things as relics or heirlooms. Proving it is, however, somewhat more problematic. Um, so that's not an answer, <laughs> but a get-out clause, as it were. OK, well, I, I think um, I, I, there is a happy sound of shrinking glasses from out, out there. Um, and they are our glasses. And, and, and uh, we have three very hard-working speakers who have done a wonderful job for us. So I think, um, really, uh, without further ado, I should ask you to thank all three speakers once again and invite you to <coughs> um, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Uh, or, well, drink and be merry, anyway. <laughs> 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 and, uh, uh, and thank you all very much, indeed, uh, for coming. But thank you to the speakers, to Donald.